The cobbles of Paru Bay are absolutely savage, and to take on the pave, riders and teams have adopted unusual and special tech. Some of that tech was a huge success, and some has been a massive fail. Tech that was hyped up to be a race-winning game-changer, but ultimately flopped harder than the Justice League driving in Sinclair C5s to the Fire Festival while wearing Google Glass. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at some of the things which we think have been tech flops and fails at Paris-Roubaix. Okay, we're going to kick things off with the RockShock Paris-Roubaix SL Fork. Imagine this, Ollie. It's 1990. Your name's Paul Turner. You're the owner of RockShock, and you have worked your absolute cycling socks off to develop a product which you think is going to change the game of Paris-Roubaix. What do you do? Plan ahead, send out the forks that you develop to all of the teams? No, absolutely not. You drive to the race with 45 suspension forks packed into a suitcase in the boot of your car and then hand them out just a few days before the event, which I think is absolutely brilliant. He even packed in a few extra sets in case other teams wanted in on the action. The thing is, though, is this kind of wasn't a flop. Because yes. in 92, 93 and 94, Paris-Roubaix was won using a suspension fork. However, it did ultimately flop because for whatever reason, riders just stopped using suspension forks and they were never a big commercial success and people never bought into the idea of having a suspension fork on your road bike because maybe it was just too niche. But another contributing factor is that in 1994, the pre-race favorite, Johan Mazeo, rode a full suspension Bianchi, taking that idea even further. And despite having, well, two to three inches of travel in the rear and one and a half inches of travel in the front, he only finished 13th and the bike was, well, never ridden ever again and Moseo went on to win Paris-Roubaix the following years after that without suspension. Incredibly heavy though, 27 pounds that bike. And that's part of the reason too, the added weight, riders have just never liked having heavy bikes. This wasn't the only time we've seen suspension used at Paris-Roubaix and I don't think it's going to be the last. No, because it was 2015 that Pinarello launched the K8S, a bike designed to give Team Sky and Bradley Wiggins the edge. It used a little elastomer damper on the rear triangle to give 10 millimeters of suspension to try and make the riders faster over the cobbles. Not much. It uses a little pivot point at the top of the rear triangle, and then down by the bottom bracket, the movement is solely coming from the flex in the carbon fiber chainstays. Now, well, despite this, and the bike was, well, it looked cool. Oh, I look cool. I love it. And I actually rode one back in the day. It was really comfortable to ride, like, on the road. I never actually used it on cobbles, but the, it did give you a bit of comfort. It was good. I think it's a cool thing. Unfortunately, Bradley Williams didn't have huge success with it, did he? No, they, they didn't get a significant result. And then again, I think it falls into this thing. It adds weight over the normal K8, of a uh, uh, normal uh, Pinarello F8 model. Yeah. And, and, and it's, well, it's just a bit of a niche product. So you don't have the commercial success, it kind of falls out of favor. Next, the year is 2016. The Pro Peloton are still on rim brakes, but to coincide with the launch of their new flagship Merida Sculptura disc, Merida decides to announce to the press and much media fanfare that the team are going to be riding disc brakes at Paris-Roubaix. Now, despite several teams, well, expressing safety concerns about this, what was the worst that could possibly happen? Well, the inevitable pileup on a cobbled sector in which Movistar rider Francesco Ventoso suffered a deep laceration to his leg, something which he blamed on a disc brake rotor from not a, a Merida bike, but a direct energy team bike from an unnamed rider. Anyway, this led him to write an open letter to the UCI with widespread condemnation of disc brake technology, saying that it should be banned. Now, this ultimately led to a delay in the widespread adoption of discs by the Pro Peloton. However, a forensic study commissioned by the World Federation of Sporting Goods concluded that it wasn't down to a disc brake, but it was down to a chain ring. Now, roll on to today, and we pretty much see everybody using disc brakes. However, at Paris-Roubaix, I don't think we can say disc brakes were a game-changing piece of technology. However, However, the adoption of disc brakes did mean that everyone could use wider tires, which at Paris-Roubaix was a pretty big deal. So what we're saying is that, well, 
when disc brakes were first unveiled at Paris-Roubaix, they were a flop. But that event where it went badly and there were these crashes and injuries just delayed the adoption and the widespread use of them. But nowadays, everyone uses them, including the race winners. Next tech flop is going to be George Hincapie's steer tube from 2006. So, carbon fibre bikes have been used in racing since the 1980s. However, manufacturers were reluctant to use carbon fibre on the fork steer tube. Theory behind that is that aluminium was simply stronger. However, ask that question to George Hincapie after his crash in 2006, where the handlebar and stem came completely separated as the aluminium steer tube broke. I mean, Trek attributed the failure of the steerer tube to a smaller, innocuous crash earlier in the race, which didn't appear to cause any damage, but most likely caused a small bit of damage to the steerer, causing it to fail later on. And end Hincapie's chances of victory when he was riding a modified Trek 5200. Self-inflating tyres and X, a technology which riders could only dream of having. Low pressures for the cobbles helping to soak up the bumps, pump your tyre pressures up to the max for high speed on the smoother roads. It's a tech which riders could only dream of. Not only that, I imagine if you get a puncture and you lose pressure in your tubeless system, you can get it back. You can have your tyre reinflated and back up to as it was and it seals. Scope Atmos were one of the brands with this kind of technology and we've kind of discussed this a lot here on GCN Tech and I thought it was a technology that was really going to take off. We saw loads of different partnerships announced with teams ahead of the race, Team DSM being one of them, and then race day comes along, boom, nowhere to be seen. Maybe even not the big name riders using it, but some of the smaller name riders in the teams, but it's not widely adopted throughout. Was it the UCI getting their rule book out and saying no to the teams using it, or was it just the riders weren't 100% confident in the technology? Who knows, another non-starter in this field was the cap system that was bigged up by Jumbo Visma. Again, what happened on race day? Well, Wout van Aert suffered with multiple punctures, including a key puncture at the decisive moment in the race when it's just him and, and Mathieu van der Poel on the car for de Laab, the final key big sector. His tyre just starts deflating and it's game over. You think, oh no, that's weird. Is this self inflated Why doesn't he just system? reinflate his tyre? Oh, yeah, he's not, he's oh, not using brilliant. it. Brilliant. Yeah, not using it. You know what? The <laughs> thing is, is if they had used these systems and Wout van Aert had used that system and it worked, we would be having a completely different conversation right now. The biggest tech successes of Paris Roubaix. <laughs> that would be so good. Now, before we get on to Alex's favourite Paris Roubaix tech fail, we have some more suspension we in the form of the specialised Roubaix, a bike which takes its name from the race. Now, the Roubaix has been around for a long time and has been very successful at Paris-Roubaix, especially in its earlier iterations, which featured zerts, which were sort of silicone implants <laughs> inside the frame on the stays. Yes, yeah, so these are on the rear stays and on the forks, the idea being, let's like say, to absorb some of the vibrations before it travels up to the rider. And this bike was actually ridden to success in the race. Yeah. However, in 2017, they unveiled their Future Shock equipped bikes, which featured suspension in the head tube in the form of a spring and a needle bearing, which offered 20 mil of travel. However, the riders weren't all convinced about this on the Quick Step team, and that led to a lot of them choosing not to use it for the very thing it was designed for. So a notable example was Nicky Terpstra, a pre-race favourite in 2017. He opted for a solid aluminium block to be cartridge to be put inside his steerer to remove the suspension element. Now, unfortunately, this failed, causing him to crash out of the race. Now, specialists say this was a pre-production part, so in theory, shouldn't even have been used in the race, and ultimately led to what we think we can call one of this designs being as a Paris Bay Tech flop. Oh, and in case you were wondering, the race that year was won by Greg Van Avermaet on a BMC with no suspension. <laughs> And so, we roll on to the final entry in our list, Alex's favourite. The Scott Euler S1, a device designed to lubricate your chain at specific intervals to make sure it never ran dry. 
<laughs> Sounds great. A boy could dream. So this thing was powered by two AAA batteries and then the container held enough lube for 52 hours of chain lubing action. I mean, if Roubaix lasted 52 hours, it's yeah. good to know that you're going to be covered the whole time. So using this device added 200 grams of weight onto your bike and you could choose the frequency at which it applied the lube onto your chain to make sure that it wasn't being used in dry conditions. Because according to Scott Euler, um, you can have a claimed efficiency improvement of up to 5%. But the big difference here is that was claimed against a chain which was bone dry, not one that was just lubricated correctly with a reliable lubricant. It was first spotted being used by Caleb Ewan when he was riding for Orica Green Edge, but we never saw it being used at a race or at Paris-Roubaix. And there are probably a number of reasons for that. The added weight was deemed to be significant. It was also pretty big, meaning that there was probably a measurable amount of increased aero drag. And, well, it just didn't really look very cool. And on top of that, well, that lube probably isn't as efficient as a waxed chain. And wax chains kind of are a much simpler solution and they don't attract as much dirt as a drip on oily wet lube. Plus, if your bike did get really, really filthy, you could just kind of do a bike change and get a clean one. Well, there you go. Those are our favorite tech fails from Paru Bay. If you have any tech fails which you think are incredibly significant, let us know in the comments section down below. And of course, if you want to support GCN Tech, subscribe, turn on the bell notifications, and all what I can say is I'm absolutely buzzing to watch the race of the weekend. Oh yeah, I love it. Who's going to win? Good. Ooh, Josh Talling. Mmm, fair. Yeah, I can get on board with that.